It's my pleasure to be here for sure. One question. Who are you? Who are you? I want you to think about that throughout this entire talk. Think about it right now as I give you a little bit more about who I am. Deneen uh, said most all of it, but again, I was drafted uh, by the Pittsburgh Steelers in 1992 in the 11th round. 291st person taken, so right away feeling really good about myself. Uh, but I managed to stick in the league for 15 years. That's unique because less than 80 people in the history of this planet have played in the NFL for 15 or more years. So I'm very proud of that. Now, I kind of laughed about it, but as I was telling uh, the president here at uh, Lebec County, uh, when they asked if, if you knew me, no, you don't know me. Why would you? Number one, you know, the generations are different. And number two, I was a long snapper. Who knows what a long snapper is? Who doesn't know what a long snapper is? Okay, and there's a lot of people who don't care what a long snapper is. And that's okay. I didn't either until uh, I realized that it was something that I could do. For 15 years, I threw a ball like this between my legs as fast and as accurately as possible. And they paid me for it. Only in America. There are so many things you can do in this world. I chose to throw a piece of aired up leather between my legs as fast and as accurately, accurately as possible. So a little bit more about long snapping. You see here, that's me with the Kansas City Chiefs. Like I said, the Steelers, the Saints, four years. Those were my character building years. And then my last uh, seven with the Chiefs. <clears throat> so, let's have a little quiz here. The game ball that I snapped for field goals. Eight yards. It got there in about .37 seconds. Traveled about 40, 40 miles per hour. And... Is spun at about 600 revolutions a minute. Just take a wild guess. How many times did that ball rotate from when I, it left my hands until it got to the holder for field goals at eight yards? What did I hear? Anything? No, 20? Okay. What's that? 287. Got a few. You know what? If it was the price of right, the, the buzzer would be buzzing because you were both over but I appreciate you participating because I don't want to talk at you today. I want to talk with you. The ball that I snapped rotated exactly three and a half times uh, before it got to the holder, every single time. Now, you might be thinking a couple things right now. Number one, um, wow, a long snapping is much more interesting than I thought. There's a lot more to it. You might be thinking, man, I was right. Long snapping is very boring. That doesn't move me at all. But in either way, there's more to it than what meets the eye. As you go along in life and the things you decide to do, there's going to be more to it than what meets the eye. And that's very, very important, especially when you start to consider who you are, who you're going to be. You're only getting started right now. I remember when I was 16, 17, 18, I think that's the ages in here, probably 15 maybe also. It was asked uh, if you knew where you were going to college or what you wanted to do. At your age, I actually didn't. And I certainly didn't have anybody trying to help me with that. So kudos to this program and everything that's going on with it. Because it is a resource that makes a huge difference. My 15 years in the league, maybe you'll recognize a few of these folks. 15 years, I was able to play for three head coaches who won Super Bowls and then are in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. My Ditka, Dick Vermeil. Bill Cower, and then the last one there, Andy Reid. Anybody know who Andy Reid is? Yeah, nobody knows who the long snapper was, but we know who Andy Reid is, right? I understand that one, that's okay. So, he's won a Super Bowl as well. I was fortunate enough to be on the Chiefs radio broadcast for the first seven years of his career. He will be a first ballot Hall of Famer. He has won a Super Bowl. So the people that I've been led by, that I've been around, that have really had an influence on me, are some very notables literally Hall of Famers. Now, all these guys, <clears throat> they could not be any more different. But the one thing they did have in common, they were intentional. They were intentional with their thoughts, with their actions. Coach Vermeil, he plans his day out still 
every 15 minutes, what is he doing? During my time with him, we knew what we were doing in practice every five minutes. If you play sports, sometimes you have those stations, you know about that. But in general, he knew everything that was going on in the offseason. They were intentional about their actions and what they wanted to do. And they were persistent. They were persistent. If you can do those two things in life, you've got, you've got a chance. There's no doubt about it. Now, they did those two, though, with one thing in mind. They were looking to create one thing and everybody that they dealt with. And that was this, their mindset. What is your mindset? What is your mindset coming in today? You saw the poster, Kendall Gamm is going to be speaking. I don't know who Kendall Gammon is. Hey, I get that. 15 years, my job was to throw that ball between my legs fast and accurately. And if I did my job, nobody knew who I was. I didn't want anybody to know who I was. But, if I screwed up, if I messed up, I'm going to tell you right now, everybody knew then. Now, I played 15 years, and I did, it, did 15 years because I did not mess up. But sometimes we do in life, right? I'll tell you a little funny story about me. Um, I, was, we, I think it was year eight or nine, I'm with the, with the Chiefs, and I'm running out to the middle of the field. We're getting ready to snap, uh, uh, getting ready to punt the ball, and I'm going to snap it. I'm running, and as I'm just jogging out there, getting ready to line up, somebody clips my heel, and I fall flat on my face. Right on Arrowhead. 77,000. Now, I don't know if all 77,000 went, oh, but enough that I heard it collectively from the crowd. Think about that. Would you be embarrassed? Would you be embarrassed? Kind of. I was. I got up. I was yelling. I was screaming. I was inventing new cuss words. All of a sudden, I'm looking around. Nobody did it. No, nobody clipped me. You know, I'm not the fleetest of foot, but I can jog without falling down. So I know I didn't do it myself. Kind of funny, but the fact is, I then reset my mindset. Because ultimately, none of that mattered. Snap the ball, we punted it, everything was fine. Forgot all about it. I walk in the locker room the next day, and our safety, Jason Belser, he was on that, and he came up, he goes, Kendall, man, he goes, I am sorry. I, I wasn't looking where I was going. You were coming out, I clipped your legs, or clipped your, your heels, you fell flat on your face. He goes, I heard the crowd, so I knew you were gonna be ticked off. And you got up and you were, and you, you, you had some words I didn't even recognize going on, so I wasn't about to say anything. And we had a good laugh about it. But, think about it. My mindset, for instant, was pure anger and mad and embarrassment. If I had let that filter through to what I had to do, what I was going out there to do, which was snap the ball, I might have done just fine, or it might have affected it to a degree that I didn't do my job well. And quite honestly, in the NFL, especially long snappers, you have one bad snap, you can be gone, your career can be over. It happens all the time. That's why I chose not to do it. Mindset. Are you creating a mindset? But now, we, I, I wanna build a foundation for this first, which is this. Throwing a ball between my legs. Would you imagine that that took a lot of practice? Now, th there's a book, Malcolm Gladwell, I think, Outliers, about the 10,000 hour rule. That to get really proficient at things, you have to practice over and over and over again. And I did that. That's how I got to the NFL. Over and over and over again. Again, I, I, I want to set this up first, which is when we talk about being persistent and intentional in our life to create that mindset, we've got to figure out the parts of our life that are going on. And there's three distinct parts of our life. No more, no less. There's your personal life, is one ring. There's your professional life. And then you're, there, there's your friends and family. Now, you know what your personal life is, it's you. Pretty much know what your friends and family life is, it's your friends and your family. Pretty self-explanatory. But your professional life. What is your professional life right now? School, that's one thing. What else is it? Work, yeah, you may be working, absolutely. And it could be your athletics or your, your dance or, you know, I was in the theater. People would be surprised to know that, you know, 
15 years of my life was in the NFL, yet my favorite thing was uh, I was in the spring musical all four years in Leeds. Loved it. Loved it much more than athletics. Much more than athletics. But don't look on the silver screen. You're not going to see me anytime soon. But it was a great time. I played the piano. I played the saxophone. I loved those things. I was in show choir. I tried to do as many things as possible to expose myself to as many things as possible. And I was intentional with that. And I was persistent. Because it took a while to practice. But again, okay, so the three, the three parts of your life. You think about it. And when you have those, you would hope that they, they overlap and interconnect in some way. So some of the things that you're intentional about or that you uh, are persistent about would match each other. Makes sense, right? Okay, so when I started here, I talked about long snapping. <clears throat> and you thought, okay, well, that's kind of an odd thing to do. It's not the most unique thing I do. I'm a juggler. I have juggled at center ring for Ringling Brothers and Barnum & Bailey Circus, not once, but twice. Caught you off guard on that one, right? We remember what the circus is, right? I know it's been gone for a while. But the three parts, the persistence. That's me, Ringling Brothers. For all you smart behinds, I'm the, I'm the clown on the right. <sighs> I'm nothing if not a clown. So think about it. Our three parts of our life. Kind of a metaphor. But the fact is, it's in the air <clears throat> at all the times. And it's changing. And what I'm focusing on changes each and every time. And that's what happens with you in your life. You're going to focus on different parts of your life at different times. Sometimes you're going to have to compartmentalize. For me... When my second son was born, both my sons were born. They, had, uh, they were in NICU at birth for two weeks. And they had multiple surgeries. I remember my second son going to a game at the Superdome with the, with the Saints. And knowing that after the game, I was going to go to the hospital and sit by the, the uh, bedside of my one-week-old who had tubes and stuff coming out of him everywhere. Now, if I couldn't compartmentalize and understand that when I was in the Superdome and I was snapping, that I couldn't think about anything else. If I couldn't do that, and I let that affect my performance that day, what could happen? Things would go haywire, right? When, would you admit that would be something that would be kind of tough to deal with? But the fact is, if I didn't compartmentalize, then I wasn't doing either one any good. Because I had to perform on the field if I wanted to take care of my family off the field. And no matter what I did after the game, it didn't matter. They, if, if I had a bad game and they're like, well, let's give him another chance. He was, he was going to see his family and some things going on. No, that's not how it works in the NFL. Sometimes you have to do that. Things are in the air. Now, as I'm juggling these, <clears throat> this side of the room on my left, you're this side. What color are the rings? They are white. The other side of the room, what color are they? Yes, absolutely. They're colors. Now, front, if I asked you all, could you really tell me what color they were? Would you even know their rings completely if you're looking at it like this? No, you wouldn't. It has a lot to do with where you're at and the perspective you have. And that's what I'm talking about. Which is... Juggling, long snapping, they both take persistence. But persistence isn't just physical repetition. It's the constant ability to look through someone or something from, from multiple angles that allows you better understanding. And it's through this understanding that you give both yourself and those you lead the best chance for success. And please note that I said yourself and others first. You have to take care of yourself. We're going to dive into that a little bit deeper here in a while because it's so important. And quite honestly, it's something I didn't do for quite some time. So what am I talking about? I said persistence. To me, it's something that I call emotional persistence. And there's one word in there that's the most important word that emotional persistence does. It creates understanding. If you create understanding, you do two things. You take away fear, 
and you foster relationships. Anything you do in this world, if you can create understanding, you will take away fear and you will, take, and you will foster relationships. And again, first and foremost, with yourself. You need to understand things that are going on with yourself to take away maybe the fear that you have of something that's happening. And then you have to foster the relationship, and yes, with yourself. I don't know about you, I'm pretty sure. For me, I talk to myself all the time. I have conversations with myself constantly, and I always will, and it's served me well. You have to take care of yourself. We'll get into that in a second. Okay, now, let's take a time out. Talk about this, I talked about perspective. Whether you see the rings from here, there, or in the front. Three different things. You can learn about a, lot, a lot about that in life. How you experience something is going to shape and form your opinion on it. And the fact is, if I asked both sides what color the rings were, you could argue until you're blue in the face that they're just white. And you're just like, no, they're the colors. What are they, what's going on over there? They have no idea. And you folks would be like, I don't even see a ring. What the heck's going on? Although he's a fabulous juggler. Um, your perspective, where do you see things? Man, in this day and age, especially in these weeks and months to come, the political scene and where we see things, trust me, I'm not gonna talk about politics, politics, but it's definitely the view you see and how you see it. How you see it shapes and forms your opinion of it. And understanding that others may see it from a different point of view that's okay, because the fact is, right here, 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 you're all right and you're all wrong. Now, think about me. I'm the one that's got all this up in the air. If I'm juggling like this, and then I move around, I turn to the side, now all of a sudden, you can see it. You're like, okay, there's rings. Now, if I start manipulating them, and you're like, oh, okay, I see the color now. You see all that stuff, it happens, because your point of view changes. Now, when I moved around, no matter how I moved, the only point of view I had was this. I saw this straight ahead. So I think you all don't have a clue what you're talking about because I know I'm right, I can see it. And the fact is, oftentimes in this life, lots of things are not concrete. They're not any one thing. Some are, there's no doubt about that. But being open to the possibility that a different point of view might be healthy to have is something that's so very important. So very important. Okay, pers perspective. As I said, acknowledge all three parts of your life. Your personal life, what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis for yourself, your professional life, and your friends and family. Look for different points of view and recognize your unique skills. As I said, I was a long snapper, I'm a juggler. I mean, trust me, that's all. That's the only two unique skills I've really got. But let me tell you a story. You would think, having been in the NFL for 15 years as a long snapper, that I probably grew up long snapping, that this is what I've done forever. No, I wanted no part of it. I, I didn't long snap till my third year in college. I was messing around. I was just curious how the ball rolled out of my hands. A coach saw me, realized I did it better than anybody we had on the team. And they said, you're going to be a long snapper. I wanted no part of it. I was an offensive lineman back then. At the time, I weighed 280 pounds. At my heaviest, by the way, in the NFL, I weighed 310. I'm 255 now. So back then in the NFL, if it wasn't bolted down, I was eating it. it looked like I had eaten a small child back then. I say that because of this. The one thing with long snapping, the minute you snapped the ball, you had to run down the field and try to cover. And... Anybody who's an offensive lineman in here uh, knows that offensive linemen are allergic to running. We want no part of it. Now, what, had hap what would have happened had I not recognized my unique skills? And quite honestly, I didn't. What would have happened if somebody else didn't recognize those unique skills and I wasn't willing to listen to them? Plain and simple, I wouldn't be here right now. I wouldn't have played in the NFL. I was not going to play in the NFL as an offensive lineman. I was good by Division II standards, by Division I standards in the NFL. Uh, no. On my best day, I might have been below average, but I could long snap. And at one point in time, for about seven or probably about 
five or six years in the NFL, I was considered the best long snapper. So in effect, the best at my particular craft in the world, albeit throwing a ball between my legs. We take what we can get sometimes, right? Everything's unique. There's a lot of different things you can do in this world. Okay. Now, <clears throat> in football, you have a depth chart. Which you, you're, you're constantly uh, evaluating the people on your team, the coaches, and what can they do, what can they not do. And you, you rank them, and, and you see what they can give to that. And it's really, it's kind of like putting a, a, a puzzle together. <clears throat> so, who here does puzzles at Christmas. Sometimes you get a puzzle out at Christmas. I, I like to do puzzles. They frustrate me. I, I don't tend to finish them all the time, but I do like to do puzzles. Now, <clears throat> when you do a puzzle, what do you generally start with? The outside, right? Okay, the, ed the edges or the, the corners? Absolutely. Yeah, because that helps define things a little bit. Now, in the middle, there's all kinds of pieces. Well, it, <clears throat> well, we'll say this. <clears throat> I've got it. There's all kinds of pieces like this that could connect on all four sides, right? These are a little bit harder. At least on, I mean, the corners, you've got a one and four shot getting them right off the bat. Now, when we talk about leadership, you know, I talk about leading yourself, leading others. When we talk about leadership, the one thing that comes up most all the time, what do you need to be able to do to lead? Would you agree you need to be able to communicate? Absolutely. You need to be able to connect with people. You need to be able to connect. At your age, I, could, I couldn't connect with anybody. That's why I was so busy in everything. To keep, to keep busy doing things, it forced me to be around people. I, I didn't always talk like this. I didn't always want to be around people like this. It took a while. I was not the centerpiece. But your leaders, the people who can really, that can really connect, generally they can connect on all four sides. Now, I would venture a guess that there's certainly some of these in here. There's some edge pieces that can connect on three sides, and there's some corner pieces. Now, we think of the leaders generally as the most important part of an organization at times, because they've got to lead, they help do things. But again, putting that puzzle together, what do we start with? The corners and the edge pieces. You know, for me, um, growing up, at the very least, I, I was an edge piece, if not a corner piece. And if there was a piece that was just a square, that might have been me also. But I evolved. I had people help me. And I began to communicate and understand that it was necessary. But that honestly didn't happen until I got out of college at the NFL. I was kind of forced into it. But again, how can you connect? Now, if you did a puzzle and all you did was look at the back side, you turned all the pieces over so you couldn't see the, the image, how difficult would that, piece, uh, that uh, puzzle be? Really difficult. I can't finish them sometimes when I can see the image, let alone if I couldn't see the image, right? Absolutely. We have to know. We can see the shape of something. We can see the outside. But unless we see the inside, what's inside of it that helps define it, then we're not sure where we want to put it. So you think about this. The physical side of it would be the shape of the piece itself. And in life, when we look at people, we see from the outside. If we're not talking to them and we just see them from a distance, we see their actions and we will see what they see and do. We see the outward part of things. But if we turn the puzzle over and we see what's inside, we've got a better chance of putting it together. For people, it's the emotional sides. It's their thoughts. It's, their, it's what they feel and express. It's what's inward. It's what's inside them. If I tried to do a puzzle without seeing what's inside, I would never get it done. So think about it. I said it earlier. Who are you? Puzzle piece. I mean, I'm not asking you to raise your hand. Just inwardly think. You know, who, am I a corner piece or am I, or am I, am I an edge piece? Or, or am, I, am, am I that center piece that could connect everywhere? And the fact is, if you don't like the piece of the puzzle that you're at, 
you have the ability to change that with help if you want to. But the fact is, I know lots of people who are corner pieces and edge pieces. That's what they've been their whole life. That's what they'll always be. And the fact is, they help define companies. They help define organizations. They are a necessity. There has to be some. What kind of puzzle would you have if there was no edge and no outline? You wouldn't know where it begins or ends. It wouldn't be very good looking either if you just had these things popping out. Now, I've talked to you a little about that. I've juggled for you. I, I talked to you about my profession and what I did. I want to have a little fun now. I mean, I can tell you about my long snapping and, and how unbelievably great I was. I'm kidding. Yeah, I'm kidding. Um, but it's better if you get to see it a little bit. So I made a little bit of a highlight video. It's okay to laugh. Quite honestly, I laugh myself. I don't know how you couldn't. If you can't laugh at this, if you can't laugh at yourself, then something's wrong. So let's see if we can play this. City and he was hurt on this play. You'll see it on the uh, replay right after the snap. They just actually run over him here. He gets knocked down. And watch when he gets up again. His own man hits him and he goes back down. And then Gammon, we saw him go down twice. He fell down a third time as he was trying to hustle downfield to cover that kick. So Now, I said you could laugh. I didn't know it was going to be that much, but no, I'm just kidding. You know what? If you can't laugh at yourself, there's something wrong in life. My job description was snap ball, get crap knocked out of you. And I decided that it would hurt less if it was a good snap. And that's what kept me in for 15 years. Now, a little backstory on that. I did not tear my knee up. At that point in time, by the way, I had played in every game that I'd been eligible for in the NFL. It was year, thir it was year 14. I had played in 218 straight games. I never missed one. It was the longest active streak of any non-kicker in the league. Now, when he said that his own teammate actually knocked him down a second time, actually my teammate's knee hit me in the leg and broke my leg right there. So, um, I did not tear my knee, but I broke my leg. So, it was kind of a rough one. I got up. I remember at the time, I certainly didn't know at the time that my leg was broken. I only knew that this was absolutely the worst pain I had ever felt in my life. Ever felt in my life. But I kept going. And I remember, I can still to this day remember thinking as I'm running down there, thinking what in the heck is going on with my leg? Thinking, man, I hope nobody breaks free because I don't know that if I can do anything. And let's be honest, with the exception of the punter, the kicker, I'm the worst athlete on the team. So it's not like I'm making a lot of tackles each and every time anyhow. Uh, I, I consider myself a sheepdog. I, I like to herd them to other people and give them the glory. I think, I think tackles are showy. But um, I remember running down and all of a sudden Phil Buchanan is coming to my right and I'm like, oh crap. And I realize I've got to do something. And I tried to cut uh, when he cut <clears throat> and my body was like, <clears throat> no, you can't. Uh, that's not going to work, and that's when I fell down. But I did make him hesitate just enough so Rich Scanlon could come on the backside and tackle him. So I did my job. I continued to snap the rest of the half. 
I would snap, I would fall down. I would try to run, I'd get up, I'd snap, or I'd get up, I'd run, I'd fall down again. I remember some of my teammates I were like, dude, just, just snap the ball and then go down because it hurts me to see you fall down like that. They were just kind of joking with me a little bit. But um, it wasn't until we went in at halftime and they, they uh, x-rayed my leg and they're like, uh, your leg's broke. It's like, okay, um, but I can still play, right? I've been doing that. They're like, no, you can't, such and such. And they, they had some reasons. And <clears throat> I was like, well, what if I go in there anyhow? And they're like, We'll take your helmet and, and, and whatnot if we have to, but we're telling you, you can't play. And there were some reasons. It was on some, some nerves and some things like that. And so I didn't. But the fact is, I got up after I went down to that pain, and I kept getting up, and I kept trying to do things. And it was a commitment I had to the folks that I was playing with. And these three questions, will you stay in the present? For me, I knew my leg hurt as I was running down there or hobbling down there. I don't know if you could call it running, right? And then I was trying to help. I was staying in the present. I wasn't feeling sorry for myself. I wasn't thinking what was going to happen. I wasn't thinking about what just happened. I was still staying in the present. Can others count on you? First and foremost, for me, I was counting on me. Because that's what I do. That's how, that was my mindset. But I didn't want to let my team down either. Then also, did, did, did I get back up? These are my, my questions to you in life and things that are going on. Life's not, life's not easy. It's not perfect. Can you stay in the present? You've heard it before. Be where your feet are. Each and every day, I fill out a gratitude journal on my phone. And the one thing that I have in there all the time, a goal, is be in the moment. And don't be anxious about the future. I know for me, no matter what has happened in my life, I always get back up. I always get back up. You're going to get knocked down. There's no doubt about that. Are you going to get back up? How soon are you going to get back up? And what attitude and mindset are you going to have when you get up? When you get back up and you go, who's counting on you? And you're like, well, it's, it's, I'm doing something by myself, maybe. Um, nobody's counting on me. Yeah, there's one person that's counting on you at all times, and that's you. You being accountable to you. Now, I've talked about this. I want to take you into my world a little bit more. Arrowhead Stadium, seven years. I would go out an hour and a half before the game, start warming up with the punters and the kickers. And that would take about 15, 20 minutes, and then I was done, because I wasn't a, an offensive lineman anymore. So I'd just go on the sideline. And what I did each and every game, home and away, is I would get a ball, like that one over there. <clears throat> and I'd walk up to a kid in the crowd with their, with their mom or dad. And I'd say, hey, have you ever gotten a ball before? And invariably they would say no. Or actually invariably they would say, and just look at me. And I would take that to mean no. And I would give them a ball and say, here, I hope you have a great day. I hope you remember this day for a long time with your family. Now, I wasn't doing that for anybody else but myself and the people I gave it to. My family didn't know I did that. The press didn't know I did that. I didn't start talking about that until after my career was over. And I started sp speaking about it because I felt like there was a lesson to be learned. Now you can imagine having given out at least 20 balls a year, home and away, that I would get some letters, some correspondence from the parents. This is one such letter from Dustin B. He was from Pawnee City, Nebraska. He said on the game versus the Detroit Lions, I gave him a ball and made him very happy. He slept, for it, slept with it for the next uh, three nights. He's in the fourth grade. I got a lot of letters like that. Uh, kids that slept with a ball for a week, a month, months, a year. Don't know how popular I was with some of those parents. I got a letter one time from a, uh, a parent that said, yeah, thank you for the ball. When my son got it, he wanted to leave. He was afraid somebody was going to steal it. Now, I don't know, but I can only assume that was in Oakland. Uh, but uh, all the same, is you get that one, Oakland's not the greatest place in the world. Okay, it's Vegas now. It's stale. You wouldn't like it. But all the same with that. Now, again, I didn't do this for any recognition for me. I did this because I wanted to help somebody else. Make, a, make something special for somebody else. But you know how we grow in this life? 
We grow in this life by giving to others and doing for others for no other reason than it's the right thing to do. For no other reason than it is the right thing to do. Now, about six, seven years ago, I woke up one morning and I had a direct message on Twitter. I never get direct messages on Twitter, but I had one. And it said, hey, do you remember me? My name is Dustin Beath. You gave me a ball when I was 10 years old. And I have a hard time saying this, but I'm getting through this story because it touches me. But I was like, yeah, Dustin, I, as a matter of fact, I do remember that. In fact, I use your story in the letter you have in some of my talks. How are you doing? And we, we exchanged pleasantries a little bit. And at the end, I said, um, one more question. Do you still have that game ball? And, and what he said will always move me. And it's the reason I did it. Which is, he said, I will never not have that game ball. I will never not have that game ball. Man, that's awesome. I didn't get anything for that. And yet I got everything, which is the self-satisfaction, knowing I made a difference in somebody's life for no other reason than it was the right thing to do. You know what? Some of the programs you're in and things you're, you're in and you have going on, people want to make a difference with you for no other reason than it's the right thing to do. And then they hope that you will carry that forward and you'll want to do that for others as well. The world's a lot better place if we're focused on doing things for others because with it, we grow inside. Now, just so you know, that's Dustin Beat that he sent me a picture. 23 years old. He went to a technical college. He became a welder. Pretty cool. I don't know if you can see back behind there. Uh, it's a picture of Patrick Mahomes. I assume that he took my picture down, but I don't know that for sure. But I'm, I'm going to go with that one. What can you do for someone else? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I want to kind of finish with this. Hard to see. But that is the house that I grew up in, in Rose Hill, Kansas. I graduated with 85 kids as a farming community about three miles out of town. Uh, oftentimes from the eighth grade on until I got a car, I would have to walk home or get a ride uh, because my mom chose not to come and get me. My dad was working, he's working very hard. My mom, I could call, I could talk to her and she said, find your own way home. Find your own way home. Now, this isn't the glamorous part of the NFL that you've heard so far, or what I've done. And when they introduced me and said, I'm just like you, you're about to hear, I'm just like you, or some of you. Some of you, it may be shocking. Some of you may be like, okay, I can relate. Some of you may not be able to relate. The ones who can't relate to me and what I went through when I was your age, thank, thank goodness, because I don't want anybody to deal with that. But that was my home. <clears throat> That was the bedroom. That was after we finished it. It used to be just be a door and a closet. I was so unbelievably proud of that. That was my bedroom. It was about nine by nine, 10 by 10. I could get a bed in there and nothing else. Now, in that house, in that bedroom, from age 10 to 16, when my parents fought incessantly, when I was abused emotionally and physically for six years, I went into my brother's room and I got a shotgun and I sat on my bed and I thought about making a permanent decision from a temporary problem. It didn't seem that way at the time, but that's the fact. And that's what suicide is. I thought about that. Thankfully, I didn't think too long. Thankfully, I decided I wanted to take care of myself. I'm not sure what it was, but I know something inside me said, okay, no, that's not the answer. But the fact is my best friend in life that I grew up with took his life eight years ago. And because of that, and because of my experience, I talk about it. Because I would bet everything I own that there's at least one person in here who has dealt with this in some fashion, either themselves or they know somebody. And the fact is you're not alone. And the fact is you can get help. Somebody wants to give you a game ball. Somebody wants to help you. Or maybe you're that person that can help somebody else. Can you do that? I've tried at times, I've failed at times. My buddy who took his own life, he was at my house the night before. I think he caught a weak, pot, a weak uh, spot 
the next day. And afterwards I found out, I knew that he was going through a divorce, but his work life was in order. What I didn't know was he was battling alcoholism. He hid it from me, he hid it from everybody with the exception of his mom. I don't blame myself, but I wonder, had I looked at him through different eyes, like we looked at the rings, how I just explained that, had I looked at him in a different way, could I have done something? Maybe, I don't know. I don't blame myself, but I will always wonder. The struggle you're in today is developing the strength you need for tomorrow. We're all battling something in here. I battle things each and every day. I go to therapy. I haven't had to. I've been through a divorce. Some of my own uh, I'm making, some maybe not. But either way, as human beings, we want to connect. We are pack animals. We need to talk. And the minute we don't talk and we become reclusive, like I've done in my life, is the minute we have issues going on. Like I said, there are people here and around. I don't mean in here, but in general. There's people who want to give you that game ball. They want to give you that game ball and help you out for no other reason than it's the right thing to do. Now, what is your emotional oxygen? What do I mean by that? We all have issues. We all have things going on. Some of you have maybe flown in here. Some of you haven't. Either way, though, <clears throat> when you fly beforehand, you have this. They say, in the, in the unlikely chance that we lose ca cabin pressure, oxygen mask will drop. And then they instruct they, they you on how to put it on. Who do they tell you to put it on first? Yourself, right? You got to put it on yourself first before you help others. If you don't put it on yourself first before you do others, at some point in time, you run out of oxygen and you can't help those. We talk about servant leadership and putting yourself last and others first, and that's great to a degree, as long as you're good with you and what's going on. It is not selfish to take care of yourself. I thought it was for years. And because of it, I broke finally. A lot of different things, we don't have enough time to go into it. Now, they say in the unlikely event of, of loss of cabin pressure, and it is unlikely. I've never had it happen to me and I've flown thousands of times. But you know what? Emotional oxygen, what's going on in your life? It's not unlikely. You're going to need that, that emotional oxygen. And my question to you is, what is your emotional oxygen? Is it prayer? Is it meditation? Is it alone time? Is it talking with your friends? Is it a charity? I mean, a, a charitable work? Whatever it may be, is there something that centers you that helps you to get back to who you want to be and how you are? What is your emotional oxygen? You're going to need it sporadically through your life. It's going to go up and down. It should be down all the time. You should have tools emotionally that you can deal with it and understand that at times you're going to need to. I promise you. I will tell you this also. At your age, I didn't have that. I hid everything to my detriment. I wish I could go over and do it again, but I can't. But what I can do is speak to people like yourselves and quite honestly, speak to corporations also like I do because they've dealt with it also. It is a real deal. I matter, I make a difference, I am enough. That is my mantra. This is what I say to myself each and every day when I wake up, when I go to bed, if I can't sleep at night, I repeat that. And the fact is, our, our minds hear what we say. We have two different types of thoughts. We have our auto thoughts, thoughts that just come into your mind. Like, like when I walked in here, some of your auto thoughts were like, who the heck is this guy? You didn't think that on your own, it just, it just kind of happened. Uh, now, some of your thoughts that you generated on your own was, man, this guy's a great juggler and he's not bad looking either. No, no, I'm, I'm kidding. The, the juggling part you didn't say, but I know the other one was, was true for sure. But no, that's my mantra. I matter. I make a difference. I am enough. And the fact is, you matter. You make a difference and you are enough. And you know what? Plagiarism is the sincerest form of flattery except in schoolwork. 
Feel free to take that. If you don't have a mantra, something you repeat to yourself that gets you on the right track, or come up with your own. Something that can get you going. Makes you feel like you're, you're ready to go. That is what I came up with. I, I kind of came up with it on my own, but I came up with it through sessions and sessions of therapy, which I still go to and will go to the rest of my life because of the issues I went through when I was your, your age. We have to take care of our mind. Our minds, if you heard it before, the fight or flight reflex, which is your mind is designed over thousands of years to take care of you and to be cautious. It either fights if you're in danger or it runs away. But it can be overly negative or it can be just too cautious. Mark Twain, I've known a great many of troubles, most of which have never happened. Our minds, they conjure up things at times. I do it all the time. On the way down here, I'm coming up with scenarios of I'm not going to do this or I'm not going to do this and it's not going to go bad. Nobody is immune to this. But the fact is you can fight it when you talk, about, you know, when you talk to yourself internally. You have a mantra. You take care of yourself. You have that emotional oxygen. We come up with so many different things that often never happen. I, I love this quote. Now, last thing I'll finish on. We all have the ability to, to focus intentionally with our focus and we can be persistent with it. What you focus on is what you give attention to. When I was running down the field, my leg hurt so bad, but my focus was on the guy on the ball and me doing my job. I didn't have time to focus on the pain. And therefore I went and I did make a difference, albeit not a huge one, but enough to get him tackled. Focus. And what you focus on produces how you feel. When you focus on something, it produces chemicals in your brain and they emit and all of a sudden you feel a certain way. You're never mad. You're never sad. You're never angry when you say those things. You think you are, you're not. It's what you feel. You feel sad. You feel happy. You feel angry. But those, just like clouds, pass 30 or 40 seconds if you wait. And then you move on with life. What you focus on is what you feel. And how you feel on a daily basis is ultimately your quality of life. How you feel minute to minute, hour to hour, to day to day, that is your quality of life. And the fact is, with intention and persistence, you control that and you alone. You control that and you alone. Are there factors that, are, that, that, that take place? Yeah, there are. There's no doubt about it. But you have that choice. And the one thing you can do, which has been a life changer for me, is understanding what I'm thankful for. Practicing gratitude. Like I said, I have a gratitude journal on my phone that I, that I do each and every day, almost religiously, of what I'm thankful for, what I want to accomplish that day. And it helps center me. And the fact is, you cannot be grateful and irritated and mad at the same time. It's one or the other. If you choose to be grateful, then that takes away the time that you could be mad or sad or irritated or whatever bad emotion you have. You can't do the two at the same time. And that's very important to realize and understand. But sometimes it's tough. You have to be intentional with it. And you have to be persistent. Because we're creating that mindset that we can do anything the way we've set out to do it. I love this by Brene Brown. I don't have to chase extraordinary moments to find happiness. It's right in front of me if I'm paying attention and practicing gratitude. Brene Brown. If you don't know who that is, look her up and read some of those books if you can. I can't recommend it enough. There's lots of other books as well, but what she talks about has been very instrumental in my life and I think it could help you as well. Gratitude. Now, I started off with talking to you about what I do, which is I'm a long snapper. I threw a ball fast and accurately between my legs. Eight yards, three and a half revolutions. And each and every time that I snapped the ball, as I said, caught the ball with the laces out, right there, three and a half times, every single time. I can still do that to this day. I've snapped the ball hundreds of thousands of times. I can do that. Can't run down the field, but I can do this. 
every time. Laces out. That's the one hashtag that I use a lot on social media if you follow me. And when I sign emails, I sign them with laces out. What do I mean? When I snap a ball three and a half revolutions, is it helping me? It is not. Quite honestly, it was kind of tough to, to learn. I finally did. Who does it help? The kicker. Helps him be more accurate. If I help the kicker be more accurate and he makes the kick, who else does it help? It helps the team. And if the team's happy and the team's winning, who else does it help? I'll tell you right now in Kansas City, it helps Kansas City and the fans. Laces out. What can you do to make a difference for another? What can you do for another? What can you do to make a difference for another? Laces out. Snap the, the ball, laces out. As I said, when I give my game ball, I'll end on this. Each and every day, we have the ability to give our own individual game balls. It's not an actual football. It could be a smile when you pass somebody that you don't know. It could be holding the door open. It could be helping somebody with their, their homework. It could be things at home. It could be helping a friend deal with some, some situations going on. The possibilities are endless. But the fact is, you have a chance to make a difference in somebody's life each and every day. And if you do that, as much good as you think you're doing for somebody else and what's going on, you will experience even greater. And I don't have time to talk about it, but they've done studies about it at universities in terms of when you do things for others and you practice gratitude, how the benefit is mostly from the person who does it and practices it. And I think that's a beautiful thing. I thank you for paying attention. Again, what is your mindset going to be? Will you be intentional with it? Will you be persistent? Will you snap the ball with the laces out? And will you give your game ball each and every time that you can? Thank you very much. Have a great day. Anything I can do, take care.